Thank you very much, Duncan. You look fabulous. There's a lot of you. You're in a slightly different place to you were last year. It's an interesting lecture theatre. It looks like a game show. <laughs> it looks like somebody's going to say, come on down, in a minute. It's, that's dated me. Does anyone else remember that? Hands up. Answer on a postcard. Thank you very much. I hope you did all behave yourself last night. I'm sure that Duncan was watching. And uh, good morning. Thank you for asking me back. Um, I was here last year as a relatively new public health minister, and I'm still here a year later, which I would suggest in modern political parlance is somewhat of an achievement. So uh, it's very much a pleasure to be back here. Thank you very much to Duncan for, for inviting me. Um, it's been another eventful 12 months for you, Duncan, and for all of you in the hall. It's been a very quiet 12 months in my place of work, and we're expecting a very quiet party conference season to come. So. <laughs> I'd like to uh, just start by thanking Duncan for a very stylish gift that he gave me a little while ago. So Duncan and Paul Cosford came to, to a meeting with me uh, last winter, and they were, Paul was wearing the, the PHE jacket, the infamous PHE jacket, and I, and I just happened to remark that I liked this jacket. Well, the next morning, uh, my own version of the jacket, adorned with blazing PHE logo, turned up at my office in the Department of Health. And, uh, and I like that jacket very much, but I have to say, um, walking into rooms wearing that jacket is a great way to win friends and influence people. They, they look at me as if to say, where are the rubber gloves? <laughs> and if that's going to turn up tomorrow morning, then I will look forward to that. Um, so since I spoke to a year ago, there's been a, no shortage of public health challenges facing us. Let me take the opportunity at the start to thank not just the people uh, in PHE, although I do, not just the people in this room and in the other rooms that are watching it on the field, but of, uh, uh, the, uh, the many, many hundreds and thousands of people who work in the, in the public health community um, and are partners in local government, and some of them are here today. I, I, I saw the Director of Public Health from Bexley, um, Dr. Gosh, earlier, who, who I went and visited in Bexley earlier this year to see some of the really outstanding public health work they're doing. So thank you to, to all of you and the wider team for the professionalism and the compassion and the focus that you've shown this year around just your day job, but also some of the awful incidents that we've had to deal with in Salisbury. And there's a debate in the House today around Salisbury and the fallout from Salisbury, from Amesbury, and of course the Northern Moor fires, where again, you really swung into action and literally saved lives and livelihoods. So teams of health protection experts worked round the clock to support local authorities, the police and the public during those difficult times, and I thank you for it. Now, since its inception, PHE has been at the heart of public health, which the, the clue was in the name. That was our intention uh, when we legislated through the Health and Social Care Act in 2013. And we set it up to deal with the day job, but we set it up to deal with emergencies like this. And you are a reassuring voice in stressful times, and you were and you continue to be amazing. So thank you very much for that. More broadly, I want to acknowledge and thank you for bringing your expertise to bear across some of the great public health challenges of our time, especially expertise none of us in government um, and with a new Secretary of State in the department after the longest serving Secretary of State in the department who I wish well in his new career. Um, we don't lose that expertise and we never take it for granted. So from what Duncan's told me and what I've heard, you've had a packed day yesterday. You had Johnny Wilkerson here last night, who I understand spoke brilliantly and from the heart, and thank you to him. Um, and you've been here since all week discussing many of the items and the conversations, the presentations, ranging across the many topics, the issues and concerns. So in particular, I was struck by some of the familiar bugbears in the, in the health profile for England data that you presented by John and Justine, I think, yesterday. Now, the data revealed that while people are living longer, this is good, they're also doing so in many instances in poorer health. Uh, meanwhile, local cultural and economic inequalities stubbornly persist. But not surprisingly, the data reported higher mortality rates from heart disease, as Duncan and I have just been talking about, from lung cancer and other respiratory diseases in some of the more deprived areas of our great country. So such problems may seem intractable, but we know that we can and we do drive positive health outcomes with the right focus on awareness, behaviour change, and above all, my passion, and one of the passions of the new Secretary of State, prevention. So the profile suggests 
that if we continue to prioritise smoking cessation, for instance, the decline in the number of people smoking will, will only continue, and that will save more lives and prevent ill health for thousands of our citizens. Meanwhile, we're still waiting to see how the combination of plain packaging and the graphic images which we rightly have put on introduced to cigarette packets last year following the new legislation affects smoking rates in the long term. Me, I'm very hopeful about that and, uh, and I would say that wherever we source the images from. More on that to follow. One thing's for sure, pictures of graphic gangrenous toes and ulcerous tongues and tar-filled lungs I think are unlikely to sell more cigarettes, but they're not going to do it on their own. It's about that kind of mentoring, those smoking cessation services that I've spoken about, which are so important. So elsewhere, there's been some good news in the media. Hard to believe, I know. As a country, we are building more affordable homes, and the recent employment figures show that unemployment falling to a 40-year low just this week. So... We still need, of course, to do more to improve the relationship between health and work. We're very aware of that, but I'm sure you'll agree this is a good base from which to build. Now, before I get into some of the, the detail um, today, I just want to recognise some of the other successes. So we recently published, just before summer recess, Chapter 2 of the Child Obesity Plan, which Duncan and I and so many of you have worked so hard to get over the line and we saw good progress on PHE sugar reformulation program, which is part of that. We've also announced um, during the last bit of summer recess the public consultation into plans to introduce broader bans on energy drink sales to under 16s. Now, energy drinks are already banned for sale to, to children by many retailers. The kids can still buy them from vending machines, from corner shops, and other outlets, and uh, we want to explore levelling the playing field. I'm uneasy about the access to these drinks. I'm sure many of you are too, and I know that as a parent, I am uneasy about them. And the message that we got across very successfully in the media that we did a few weeks ago was that these drinks are not appropriate for children. Um, and we'll be looking at the results of that consultation very carefully, um, and we want to act. So this is the beginning of a process. I'm confident that the news will get sweeter, or rather it won't, um, as we push forward with this and other initiatives in Chapter 2 of the plan. There's a lot of consultations to get out there on the stuff we announced in the plan, and we're hopefully getting them all out this side of Christmas. There you go, I've mentioned the C word. Anyway, and we recently also launched the support program, which I'm very personally pleased to be associated with, and the former Secretary of State and his shadow <laughs> Secretary of State John were very closely identified with, which is the program for children of alcohol-dependent parents. Now, £6 million will be released over three years with PHE in charge of this innovation fund to spur creativity in the sector. And it was striking when I did the, the media round announcing this policy, how many journalists came up to me quietly afterwards and said, you know, Steve, I was one of those children and the number of people who've contacted me to say I too was one of those children has been very striking and interesting and tells me that there is definitely a problem to be addressed here. And I announced during health questions to Parliament, we went old school and actually announced something to the House of Commons. The Speaker was very pleased that HPV, and I always want to please the Speaker, uh, I announced that the HPV vaccine, which protects against cervical as well as other cancers, will in future be offered to adolescent boys as well as girls. And I know this has been a campaign that many of you have supported for a long time, uh, me too, um, and I was really, really pleased to get that out there just before summer recess, and the response to that has been really, really positive. So um, there will be a, a long time before we see the benefits of, of that policy, but uh, it's the right thing to do. Good news on the prevention front too, with the recent uh, announcement that in time bowel cancer screening will start at 50 rather than 60. My first priority is for NHS England and for PHE to, to begin rolling out the new FIT test this autumn. Uh, and this work will save many lives, there is no question about that, and form a very strong foundation, I hope, for future bowel cancer prevention. And I want to thank Deborah Elsina and the team at Bowel Cancer UK, the newly merged Bowel, Bowel Cancer UK and Beating Bowel Cancer, for their positive engagement with all of us on that. It really is much appreciated as part of what I call Team Cancer. 
Now, as you know, on that subject, cancer prevention is, of course, very close to my heart. Um, I have to say, I, I've, I've fought cancer in my family, as all of you have, um, and I've lost more than I've won, which is one of the reasons why I'm in Parliament. Uh, and that just doubles my determination on the subject. So while we know two-thirds of cancers might be down to, to bad luck, um, we know that a third are preventable. And disappointment, therefore, doesn't begin to express how I and others felt upon discovering the historic breast cancer screening failure earlier this year. So PHE and my department and NHS England moved extremely quickly to investigate and mitigate the damage as far as we could. It was, frankly, the least we could do. Um, and what the Secretary of State said in Parliament, we all iterate that we are very sorry that that happened, but we can only but put it right, and we are determined to do so, and we are doing so. In the meantime, we continue to raise awareness of cancer symptoms and encourage people with concerns to visit their doctors without delay. To this end, we've run 14 national Be Clear on Cancer awareness campaigns since 2010. The latest Blood in the Pea campaign is out there now. Um, now, it seems to be working too. Just under 2 million people were seen by specialists for suspected cancer, over 1 million more than in 2010. That's an increase of 115%. That is a fantastic result by any measure. We are evaluating at the moment the ACE centres, the Accelerate, Coordinate, Evaluate centres, the multidisciplinary teams. I visited one in Oxford early this year. And as I've said many times to the House of Commons, I don't easily get excited, contrary to my persona. But I, I am excited about the ACE centres. I think they have great potential for GPs who are presented with vague symptoms, abdominal pain symptoms, for instance, where um, members of the public can, can be referred into the ACE centres and get quick-fire diagnostic tests instead of going through the cycle of test, appointment, wait, appointment, test cycle. We want to get them through quicker so that we can diagnose, as we know, early diagnosis remains cancer's magic key, to quote one of my parliamentary colleagues. So I'm very excited about them. And set a bench against a backdrop a very difficult backdrop. We've seen some real improvements in other health outcomes since we last spoke. We've got the lowest ever smoking rates for adults and 15-year-olds. On this form, as little as 10% of the population could still be smoking by 2023, but we want to do better. Um, and that's why the prevention agenda is so important in that space and the, and the, the mentoring cessation services I mentioned are so important to me. We were one of the first countries in Europe to see a substantive decline in new HIV diagnoses. We're already ahead in meeting two of the three ambitious UN AIDS 1990-90 global goals. I'm very pleased about that and I appreciate the work that you do with me on that. Indeed, just last week, we announced that new HIV diagnoses in the UK have fallen to their lowest level since 2000. This is testament to the sustained focus on prevention, on successful testing programmes, and the advance in treatment that we've seen in this area um, in, in recent years. Now, in a very tough winter for flu globally, and we are heading towards winter again, more than 14 million people, an increase of almost 1.5 million people compared to the year before received their flu vaccines. And obviously yesterday you announced the new enhanced vaccine for the over 65, which has received a lot of press coverage this morning. Um, we need to do even better on flu vaccinations this year. I know that many of you will, and I hope will take that message out back to your various places of work. So there's much to celebrate um, and every reason, I think, to be optimistic for the achievements that we have yet to come. So everything I've mentioned so far sits comfortably, I think. Um, we don't just make this up as we go along. Within your three conference themes, it's also happened to be the focus of my speech today. So promoting world-leading science and evidence, making the economic case for prevention, very important, and working towards the healthier, fairer society. So let's start with the science and the evidence. I've mentioned PHE's reputation as a world-leading organisation many times, and I, as I've illustrated, you're undertaking some remarkable work in our country and around the world. So the work on whole genome sequencing of pathogens and what this means for stopping outbreaks in their tracks 
that takes my breath away, Duncan. And it's another, it's another thing this morning that gets me excited. That's two. For example, the TB genome sequencing could allow faster diagnosis and treatment by identifying the particular species causing the infection and therefore the potential antimicrobial resistance. This is groundbreaking work. So while genome sequencing for other pathogens, including Salmonella, will follow, I'm sure, this is good work. And these advances in technology continue at pace within PHE. So from exploring the use of AI to predict disease outbreaks to analyzing population stats to develop more nuanced interventions, data has never been more indispensable, I would suggest. So working with your equivalent organizations in the devolved administrations, you're responsible for supporting delivery of the government's AMR ambitions. So since the program was launched, PHE has co-produced national antibiotic prescribing guidelines. We've got the public-facing campaigns, uh, including the TV ads with, with singing antibiotics, very good, um, to manage patient expectations and resources to support reduction in their use. And we, will be work, we are working now on the refresh of the AMR strategy, which runs to the end of this year, and that will start at the turn of the year. There's a great deal of interest in this community and inside Parliament. Just yesterday, I was giving evidence to the Health Select Committee around AMR, um, and this is one of the big challenges we face, because without the, the effective drugs, our health system grinds to a halt. It is as simple as that. So another demonstration of the value that in this area I think you bring to public health is the expertise, the support and the evidence you provide to local authorities to help them prioritise. I mentioned one already, but that there are many representatives in the hall and in adjoining halls from our, our brilliant local authority colleagues. Now you might do this through evidence on the return on investment, which of course they are very interested in, on sharing best practice, which you're brilliant at, or the new quality framework currently in development. And I need that to go further and faster, and I need you to drill down, deep dive into local authorities to help them make the best of their public health spend in an, in an era of tight resources. So I think this all supports effective evidence-based action at local level, and it will be different in different areas, leading to better health outcomes for our citizens. It also helps tackle regional health inequalities with a little more precision and insight, and that's why I ask you to go further in that regard. So the economic case for prevention. So pre precision and insight are very much part of our, of our second theme, making that economic case. One which is already, I would suggest, well established. Indeed, our new Secretary of State, Matt, has shone a spotlight on prevention as one of his three priorities. He's made it a top of, of his, one of his three priorities alongside supporting our dedicated health and care workforce and exploiting the full potential of technology to deliver improved health comes. Now, you'll hear more about this from Matt soon. It's becoming more apparent that intervening early and focusing more on prevention to stop or slow down future ill health can give people extra years of life, can reduce premature deaths and mitigate long-term illness among working age people. Cost, it costs the UK economy some 100 billion pounds a year, is, is our estimation, and around 330,000 people every year become unemployed because of health-related issues. And that is the economic case for prevention, if ever I heard one. So investment in public health services is also cost-saving, not just cost-effective, I would argue. Every one pound spent on alcohol misuse services, Duncan often reminds me, delivers a return of almost five pounds in the short term. Every one pound spent on contraception services saves an estimated 11 pounds in healthcare costs. These are figures I like to keep reminding our new Secretary of State, and I can tell you that he is incredibly receptive and listening. There have been many false dawns on prevention. But we are moving forward now, I think, into a new normal. In, uh, that would be my prediction. So incentivizing the industry to reduce the sugar content of soft drinks. Now, that drew understandable skepticism and even a little bit of criticism from some quarters. But nonetheless, you cannot deny the levy has delivered strong results. Over half of all drinks that would otherwise have been targeted by the tax have reduced their sugar content before the levy's introduction in April this year, the equivalent of 45 million kilograms of sugar every year. Now, that is not nanny state. 
that's the sound of pennies dropping. And I am very proud of that policy and the impact that it's had. So the upcoming NHS long-term plan with a focus on prevention, reducing health inequalities, provides a further opportunity, I would suggest, to maximize efforts to improve health outcomes and reduce health inequalities, one we must grasp together. This is not simply about cutting costs or saving money. It's about improving the quality of life and helping people lead healthy and happy lives alongside their work, their education, and many of their caring responsibilities. Evidence suggests access to healthcare contributes no more than 20% to the health outcomes of a population. So spending more money doesn't necessarily improve our outcomes. However, what we do spend it on matters a heck of a lot. Meanwhile, the social factors such as housing, which is why I mention it, our education and the environment continue to have a very large impact on our population health. So I'd like to take the opportunity this morning to recognise and thank local government. The work you do on the ground through place-based approaches makes joining up these different factors much, much easier. One example I would mention is the government's policy to allow local authorities to keep more of the income that they spend through retained business rates. Now, there's a lot of speculation and concern about potential changes to the way local authority public health functions are funded. Let me be clear again and assure you that my priority is to see that future funding arrangements protect public health services and improve health outcomes. Meanwhile, at a national level, we need to work together if we are to make my final theme and our, our also shared goal a reality, a healthier, fairer society. So the population in England is growing, it is aging, and it is diversifying rapidly. 40% of morbidity is preventable, and 60% of 60-year-olds have at least one long-term condition. Helping people stay well in work and in their own homes for longer is vital for all of us. Now, the gap in healthy life expectancy between the most and the least deprived areas of England is around 19 years for both sexes. And you'll be aware of the Prime Minister's grand challenge to extend a person's period of healthy, independent and active life by five years, by 2035. She sees that as part of the burning injustices agenda. And she's dead right. You won't achieve this by simply adding five extra years at the end of life. As with many things, the earlier we start, the more we stand to gain. So investment in early years is essential to our mind if we want to positively influence future lifestyle choices, hence the child obesity strategy. Prevent disabling conditions and enable people to contribute fully to the society that we need them to do. We need to continue to focus our efforts on areas like digital tech, and behavioural science so that we can show the public that moving, making the healthy choice is the easy choice, not the difficult choice. Now, ideally, this would be in the context of supportive and inclusive local communities, providing the peer support and the person-centred care some statutory services can't always reach. But regardless, it is our responsibility and makes economic sense to prioritise improvements to health where the need and the opportunity to do so is the greatest. Now let me look at cardiovascular disease that Duncan and I were talking about just before we came in and the primary care successes in treating it. Now doctors and nurses delivering the NHS health check in both primary care and in our community settings have helped over 7 million people reduce their risk of CV disease by supporting them to make better lifestyle choices like stopping smoking. So involving and empowering local communities I think will also help reduce inequalities and combat social cohesion. Here's a stat that I find quite astonishing. Loneliness can have the same impact on health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, on this point, I'm delighted that you, you heard from the, the Culture Minister uh, for Loneliness and the Sports Minister, Tracy Crouch, who was here this morning, who is a, is a good friend and a very experienced minister. Now, she will doubtless touch on, or doubtless she did touch on the link between social isolation and in ill health. And my department is fully behind the cross-government work to tackle loneliness and the mental and the physical damage that it can cause within and between communities. And I look forward to working closely, as I do on many other areas with Tracy on that subject. 
Now, I know PHE have been working hard to make sure that community-centered approaches to, to ill health and well-being are taken seriously and more widely adopted. The UN has also recognized the importance of a, of a broad community-based approach to 17 sustainable development goals, which range from ending poverty through job creation to economic growth in deprived areas of our country to environmentally and socially responsible production and consumption, which, as we're talking about activity beyond our shores, seems a good moment to briefly mention the B word. We've done the C word, the B word, of course, being Brexit, not Brian. Britain, my view this, Britain making its own way in the world. It's nothing new for a start, but it doesn't mean severing our links with other nations, far from it. So we will continue, of course, to work with other countries on global health security issues, as we have for years on AMR, on infectious disease outbreaks, and other major incidents, including the chemical, the biological, and the nuclear. So it's a moral imperative, which will, of course, endure beyond March the 31st next year, March the 29th next year, and which one which I'm sure, sorry, I extended the transition period there for two days, uh, which, which will, will be shared with G20 health ministers when we meet in Argentina next month. I'm looking forward very much to the summit. Sadly, I won't be able to go to Conservative Conference, but sometimes ministerial duties take you away. So I'm looking forward to the summit, in particular PHE's AMR stimula simulation exercise, which uh, I'm sure will do much to raise awareness and understanding of the challenges arising from AMR, which we will be doing with Sally, our Chief Medical Officer. And staying with the global perspective, if I may, it's great to see that international health regulation strengthening programs are now running in four countries. So add to that the UK's public health rapid support teams. We've successfully deployed them to nations including Bangladesh, Nigeria, Madagascar, and the DRC. Uh, this Department of Health and Social Care funded partnership between your organization, Duncan, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine delivers important work and is highly valued, not just in Whitehall, but I know around the world. So, so whether it's negotiating with the EU or helping nations beyond their borders, we'll be building consensus for fair and sustainable global development with better health the essential outcome. Likewise, PHE will continue to be a world-leading organization in these areas, I have no doubt, and the reputation of your dedicated team here and out in the country will go from strength to strength at home and abroad. So as I close this morning, I'd like to just highlight what I believe is the, the challenge for all of us. I think we need our Blue Planet 2 moment. Um, I think we need to increase our impact on the whole of society with genuine cross-government action locally and nationally, co-opting the best scientific brains and innovations. And I think we need to be brave. This is a publicly funded health service. We have a right and a responsibility to help the public lead healthier lives. So together, we all have a role, not just in reacting to societal preferences, but in shaping them. That's where we need to be bold. We need to take full advantage of the benefits prevention brings to the economy. Healthier populations mean healthier public services and healthier economies. So let me just reiterate how much I appreciate the huge effort everyone is making to improve and protect the nation's health, whether you work in PHE, in local government, the voluntary sector, or elsewhere in the system. I know there are many real difficulties to overcome, but we have a real opportunity to fuse our talent for innovation with our community endeavor to deliver positive change for this generation and my children's generation and their children's generations to come. It's daunting, uh, you know, but it's exciting too. And if we get this right, that's one legacy that I'll be very happy to share with everyone in this room. So enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much for having me here. <laughs>